What's going on, everybody? Welcome to My Social Life. This is the podcast where we sit down and talk to influencers about how they grew their following and what they did to monetize their social media. My guest today is Mathieu Doré. And Matt is a ultra marathon runner. And an ultra marathon is a race longer than your average marathon. So he's ran 100 mile races. His longest race was 240 kilometers. And he runs that as an individual. It's not a relay where like five people team up to break it into pieces. He's ran 240 kilometers on his own. That is just a true test of endurance and mental fortitude. And it's something that I just, I can't even wrap my head around. And on top of that, Matt is also a fitness coach and he has 13,000 Instagram followers. And in this podcast, we get into a lot. Matt has some crazy stories from being an ultra marathon runner. We also talk about the work he's done with Nike and he's got some stuff coming up with Lululemon. There's just a ton of good stuff. We talk about how he grew his social media to over 13,000 followers because it's not an accident. He made a change in his posting and everything to get there. So I don't want to waste any more time. Let's just get right into it. Welcome back, everybody, to My Social Life. This is the podcast where we talk to people that are absolutely killing it on social media, and we learn how they did it and what they do. And my guest today is, is Matthew or Matthew, actually? I haven't actually asked it's you. Which do you prefer? Matthew, Matthew, but Matt works or Maddie or, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Cool. So my guest today is Matthew Dore, and I'm going to let you kind of tell everyone a little bit about yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, so, wow. Um, right now, basically, yeah, I'm, I'm a coach. Uh, basically a running coach. I'm a strength conditioning coach for mostly endurance athletes. So anyone that runs, you know, from I would say 10K and above, you know, some ultra runners. I also train some cyclists. Um, and I'm pretty much, you know, I love the adventures as well. So I run myself quite a bit. So I'm an ultra marathon runner. I do adventure race. So I'm always basically outdoor enjoying the outdoors. So and for people that don't know, so what like separates an ultra marathon from just a marathon? Yeah, so basically a marathon is 42.2K uh, kilometers or 26.2 miles. Um, and anything above that is an ultra marathon. So it could be a 50K. Uh, I've done a race that was 240 kilometers. So, you know, it's anything above the marathon. It's called an ultra marathon. Yeah. Okay, so like how did you, you get into running? Because you didn't start as a runner, right? No, exactly. So I was basically an ice hockey player, probably like most kids that grew up in Canada. Yeah. Uh, so basically grew up on skate. That was my main sport. Um, running was just a type of form to keep me in shape yeah. during summertime. And um, then after that, it was in high school. In high school, I we'd done track and field. Um, and I wasn't bad at running, I found. So that's where I got into it a little bit more seriously. But I, it's just something I would compete like two months, you know, where we had our track and field season. Um, and then it's after in uni, uh, university, my last year, I've quit hockey because I knew I was not going to make the, the NHL. Yeah. Uh, so I took running a little bit seriously. And I've done the um, cross country season with University of Ottawa and the indoor track. And it kind of blew up from there, basically. Yeah. So yeah. you did. So you really were like on the team at U Ottawa then? Yeah. 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 And then. What was like the distance for that? Was it like a 10K? Or? Yeah, so the cross country season, it was races that were anything in between 5 and 10K. Um, and then the indoor track, I would compete in anything in between 800 meter to 3000 meter. Um, so that was on a 400 meter track where sometimes some, some races were on the 200 meter track. Yeah. Um, so it was fun. It was just a little different. I, I'm very competitive. So after I saw, I just needed something to be, you know, to get that competitive edge yeah. off me. So yeah, so that was a great way of, of doing it. Yeah. So when did you start to get into the ultra marathons and kind of really ramp up the distance? Yeah. So for me, after a while, like. All the speed stuff, because ice hockey is very explosive, right? And, you know, it's 45 seconds, 60 seconds, you know, all out. And then that's why running was the same thing. It was like basically cross country wasn't too bad because it was, you know, a 30 something minute effort. But I really enjoy the easy runs. Like I really enjoy just going out there, you know, 
for a long time, exploring different areas. So that's where after university, um, that's in 2010, I signed up for my first half marathon. Um, and that was the winter man. Yeah, it was middle of winter here in Ottawa, Canada. It was probably like minus 25. And that was my first half marathon. I'm like, you know what? Different challenge. And also I trained a little bit for that race and, you know, I've done quite well. So I was like, man, I'm not that bad at that. And I was really enjoying the, the change of pace in terms of training, you know, like to put in some easy mile instead of always going hard, hard, hard for a short period of time. So that year, 2000, then I, I did my first half. Then I went to trail running. I did a 21K trail race in New York State in Bear Mountain. Then I did a 35K a few months after that in Mont Tremblant um, trail race. And then I ran my first marathon in Montreal in September 2010. So that was kind of like my introduction to endurance running, I guess. And then it's just kind of like, I think it was December that year, I've met someone, she was doing a 200 mile race. And I'm like, what? In Vermont? So, and she's like, Matt, you should try and do the 100 mile race. So that's 160 kilometers in the mountains. And I'm like, well, if you can do 200 miles, for sure I can do 100 miles, you know? So what the heck? I signed up and that was in May 2011. And basically train so hard. Like I was running 160 to 180 Ks a week, you know, doing strength training twice a week, doing yoga twice a week. And uh, yeah, I've done that race and came third. And I'm like, wow. So that was my introduction to ultra running. I went from a marathon, you know, to 100 miles. So basically 42 K to 160 K. So that was... That was me, my first ultra marathon. I would not recommend it, that big of a jump to anyone <laughs> and to any of my athletes, but I was clueless. I was young. I had no guidance and I just wanted a different challenge and I, I enjoyed it. I think the fact that you went from like, you kind of just jumped into such a long, long race Yep. and then you still came third is, is impressive. Just kind of like, I yeah, that's kind of just telling where you kind of like, after you finish that race, you're kind of like, maybe I should do more of these exactly yeah. and that's exactly it. and that's what happened like in the next you know that's basically what i've done for the last six seven years now um yeah trail running uh basically exploring different areas and you know i've been to europe i've been everywhere in the united states i've been west canada you know australia and yeah that's my passion now it's just a way to explore different trails different areas like you explore in one day that basically most people would take you know three to four days but we do that race you know usually yeah in a few hours during the day so it's a beautiful way to see different side of the world so how long does it take to do like just say for example a 100 mile race yeah that one so it all depends on how technical the the trail is or how hilly it is so that one took me 24 hours so, yeah, it was 160 Ks and we climbed about 8,000 meter, which is all, almost Mount Everest, you know, going up and down, up and down. So it accumulates to about 8,000 meters of up and down. Um, so 24 hours that one. My longest one was 27 hours nonstop. So that was the 240 K I did in 2013 from the ocean. Uh, in Australia, so the yeah. coast of New South Wales to Mount Kosciuszko, so highest peak in Australia. So that was a non-stop race, basically running, you know, as fast as you can from the sea to the highest point in Australia. Yeah. yeah. So like you say non-stop, you mean like you don't stop to take a nap or anything at all? Like so it's... it all depends how it goes. You try not to stop. So my first 100 mile, that one in Vermont, after 100K, I was freaking done like i had to lay down you know in the grass for about two three hours and nap because i was puking you know i don't know like my stomach was all wrong so i rested for two three hours and then got up was able to put a little bit of food in me and then kept going and you know trying to smash that last 60k then the 240k race that i did everything went pretty well like i only sat down twice and it was to put long pants on because we started it was hot on the ocean and then we got to 
you know, you get to around 1800 meters of altitude and there was snow. So it was getting cold. So I had to put some tights on to keep me warm. And I sat down another time just to, I had, at that point I had 15K to go. And that one too, I was fighting for third place. So I was fighting for podium and basically the, the fourth place was catching up and I was slowing down and nothing was going and I just needed to sit down relax put my head down for like 45 seconds and then I sit down on the rock and then got up again then I was I managed to kind of like kick in into gear and get back in the game basically so when you're doing like do you have to bring like a, a backpack or anything like with like water and food or like yeah so every race are different like some are self-supported some some yeah you have to bring you know all your stuff for the race uh, most of them now they're you can have a crew that meets you at certain checkpoints along the way um so th that's awesome so and even some of them you're allowed pacers you know, so some of them, it's like, okay, you can run, you'll run 100K on your own. And then the last 60K, you're allowed someone to come and run with you, you know, so they can help you out, you know, to pace yourself and, you know, with fluid, remember to take some food, you know, all that kind of stuff. So there's always, depending where you race, there's always mandatory gear. So stuff you need to carry in case you get injured, you can survive there until someone comes and gets you because most of those rates race were in remote areas right so you know it's kind of like waterproof jacket space blanket you know enough food so you know if they send help you can survive there for a day right before like the rescue team come and get you yeah you've never had to be rescued or anything though like you've never been in that situation no 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 i've been pretty lucky i've been pretty lucky like i had some you know some issues but never to a point i needed to get rescue yeah so. that's fair and then so after i heard you know, on a different podcast yep and it was so after your first one you kind of worked your way up to i think you call it like the boston marathon of yeah ultra marathons it was in chamonix right yeah exactly so when i started ultra running like uh ultra trails mont blanc which is utmb so that's kind of like yeah that's the boston marathon of ultra running it's it's basically the ultra marathon everyone wants to do and so when i started ultra running um I just pick point races where you need to get, you know, qualifiers. So I'd done enough race and I've done well enough in those race that I got enough points and then you get into a lottery and then first time I applied, I got in. So it was freaking sweet. So yeah, I got the chance. That was in 2013. I got the chance to go race in, in Chamonix in France which was unbelievable beautiful experience um it's along the alps there you basically run through three different countries you start in france you go through italy switzerland then you come back to france so do you need to bring a passport on the race no no, no. <laughs> yeah that's a great question but <laughs> no i guess european countries works a little differently but from what i remember i didn't have my passport on me so yeah how'd the race go like how'd you place did you do well at it so or? that race um so man it was a bad luck my one of my best buddy came and crew me so he's he's uh he's been through a lot of stuff he's a cancer survivor and he basically i wanted him on my corner for that big big race because he's an inspiration for me um because he's basically a walking miracle and um basically 24 hours before the race um he got hospitalized so he had some big um seizures yeah so basically i was in the ambulance with him and in the hospital with him 24 hours before my race and we thought because he had brain tumors and all that kind of stuff but that was like two three years ago but we thought man they might be coming back so but there was no way he wouldn't let me race. So what happened? I spent the whole night at the hospital um, because basically we weren't allowed to stay at the hospital. But then I ran to the closest town trying to find an hotel because it was basically 90 minutes from our uh, previous hotel in Chamonix. So, man, so everything was booked. So I ran back to the hotel, slept on the, the floor, you know, at his... Uh, 
uh, not the hotel at the the hospital mm -hmm. slept on the floor there until like a nurse was like man you can't stay here i'm like well i got nowhere to go i can't get a cab so finally they found a cab for me went back to my hotel then came back to the hospital because the race starts at 4 p.m um so basically 24 hours after he got hospitalized and then um yeah my buddy was like matt like you gotta go race like i'll be fine you know i'll be in the hospital for the next couple of days so just come back after your race so um what i, I did my girlfriend at the time stayed with my buddy there and then i went uh and start the race but only raced half of it so i did 78 kilometers uh to como and then took a bus back to the hospital so that was my experience that's It's crazy. But it's it's crazy but at that point like the race didn't matter anymore because yeah, like it was my best best buddy in the hospital like i wanted to be there but he would not let me because he knew how hard i worked for that race um so you know i respected his is you know what he wanted me to do and yeah i went to race and then just yeah after i ran through the night because you start at 4 p.m i basically ran till 3 a.m took the bus and came back Yeah, that, that's why. <laughs> yeah, pretty crazy, eh? As you touched on something, I kind of want to unpack a little. You said he's an inspiration to you. Yep. So is that was, and you also referenced he had like brain tumors at one point. So are those, yeah, is that part of the reason why? Or well, because basically, um, this guy, uh, my buddy Luke, he, I met him. I used to work at Greco. That was like years ago, like oh, maybe eight, nine years ago. And I met him, he was like skin and bones, like 110 pounds, you know, like no hair, like no, nothing, nothing on the guy. And I basically had the task to train him three times a week and like, you know, regain confidence, you know, regain some muscles. So I trained him for about six months, three times a week. So like we created a good bond because for him it was, you know, not a matter of, you know, building muscle mass again but building like confidence again because he could barely like you know he would sit down on a chair and could ba barely stand up right so after six months we made some massive progress like we would go for lunch all the time and i would try to motivate him and you know but in return he was like my biggest motivator because like he basically started with nothing because he had uh testicular Uh, cancer then it spread to his dad the man then he had basically four or five brain surgery because he had three brain tumors so like cancer all over the place but he somehow beat the odds and survived and i just met him like after all that shit he's been through yeah right so and then um after six months he basically got you know seizures Uh, again, so that's where that's so, yeah. So after that six months, he got seizures again, and then he got like a few, you know, he was in the hospital for another three months, and then again, I, you know, we I trained him again, and then two years after, that's when we went to Chamonix and he got some more seizures, but he was all fine. It was just because of dehydration, scar tissue in his brain. Um, high altitude he got those seizures but it was pretty scary at the time because that's we thought like his seizures were yeah, no you know a sign of his brain tumors coming back so yeah. that's why like yeah with all the brain tumors and all that basically their doctors said that you know this guy luke is a walking miracle so he's always been a great inspiration to me because he's a business owner you know he's very successful um so yeah Did he ever run with you or um he's not much of a runner no and because like all the stuff he's been through yeah. like his hips are a little bit you know um yeah running is but yeah we would do strength training together you know like we grab beers all the time together you know he's just yeah we just became best buds basically yeah. um and he just taught me to see life a little bit differently because you know he was he was a young kid like you know a young guy in his 20s basically uh living the dream living life you know and all of a sudden bam you yeah. know he got struck by cancer you know so it just kind of like showed me man you got to live day by day and enjoy the most of every moment so yeah. that's what i appreciate about this guy because yeah the attitude he has as his perspective is probably like on life is yeah you said it's just definitely completely different from anyone else absolutely absolutely so 
So yeah, that's my buddy Luke, and uh, yeah, that's why. So one day I'll go back to UTMB. You know, it's I got unfinished business, but I never, never ever regret. You know what happened there because for me, yeah, race is important, but you know, a good buddy is is more important than anything else. So yeah, yeah. So is that race like something you're going towards like soon? You think? Or? Um, yeah, like you know, it's, it depends what happens in life, but definitely like in the next five years, I'd love to to do it again. Yeah. Definitely, because yeah, it's such a beautiful, beautiful place. The atmosphere that week is is phenomenal. You know, it's kind of like the pinnacle of trail running and ultra running. So yeah, yeah. Hopefully, I'll be back sooner than later. Back to the the first the U- UTMB. Yep. Yeah. So was it shortly after there that you moved to Australia? Yeah. So, wow. Yeah, that was a big year. So I did UTMB that year. And then because like I was so well trained for that race, but I didn't have, I didn't get to race at my potential. Um, And then I met a girl in a race in Dead Valley, California a few months before that. So, and she was from Australia. So I was like, wow you know what, might as well do a race in Australia. And we find that race and that was the close to Kazi. So that that was the 240K race that I've done basically three months after UTMB. Um, I've done that race um, and came in third. So everything went so well, stayed there for about a week. It was a very quick trip. Um, But my dad at the time was very unwell. So he was going through some cancer treatment. So I told my my ex now australian girlfriend that i wasn't able to stay in australia so she came back with me and we stayed in canada for a few months until my dad got the all clear from his cancer so yeah he was an animal going through his his cancer treatment you know he'd done really really well and then once he had the whole clear we moved to australia and i was there for almost four years basically yeah yeah that's crazy. And just one thing you so you said it was three months between UTMB and then the Costa Kazi. Yep. What's the usual like turnover time between runs? Like how like what's Whoa. the rest and recovery like? Yeah, it- like I mean everyone's different. Yeah. I wouldn't recommend like if yeah, usually I'll do maybe two big ultras a year. Anything over a hundred kilometers, maybe you can pull out two good ones. But there's some like very unique human beings out there. They back it up like every couple months. It's insane. But what I've seen, you know, by experience is they're able to do that probably for two years and then their body will probably break down at some point and then be off for a year. You yeah. know what I mean? But if you want to stay healthy, stay injury free, uh, you know, not get, you know, general fatigue or adrenal gland fatigue or whatever. Um, usually, you know, if you have two a year, it's pretty respectable. And I've learned that the hard way. Like the first two years I was in ultra running, I've just raced so much, so hard. And I've had some good results. But then for a year, I was like total write off. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And then, so what's the week like right after a race? Like, like you oh. run like 100K and then the next week. Yeah, it's basically... Yeah, it's recovery mode. So you do whatever you want. Basically, you eat whatever you want. You you know, you drink whatever you want. So it's it's the beauty about it. And I'm someone that's all about balance. You know, there's there's a lot of ultra runners that, you know, are are very I would say a lot healthier than me on their food choice and, you know, their their ways, then I'm all about balance. I'm always like if I train hard, and I was so good for a few months. You know what? The week after, I'll have a few beers. I'll have a few scotch with my brothers or friends. You know, I'll eat pizza as much as I want. Like, I don't really care. I just want calories, right? And I'll just make sure to rest, you know, sleep a whole lot. Because that's that's your number one recovery tool. Mm-hmm. Um, so basically, and then I'll move. You know, I'll still go for walks or easy jogs or maybe get on my bike, do some cross training, maybe paddle um but yeah most of the time you don't really feel like 
running, you know, yeah. for a week. You want to do different things because you've been running so much in preparation. So it's a good way to, you know, maybe go for a walk, you know, with mom or, you know, go paddle with your, your buddy. Do different things, basically. Reconnect with people you haven't been connecting with because you've been so focused in your training. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so back, sorry, back Australia, I keep getting yep. sidetracked. Like, yeah, it's just so interesting to me. But so you to kind of just move to Australia, did you have a plan when you move? Do yeah, I... well, I was sponsored by my ex-girlfriend. So I had no plan. The only person I knew was my ex-girlfriend. So it was scary, you know, because, yeah, I was like, hey, I'm moving to a whole different country. I only know one person and I got to build a life here. So we were lucky. We, were, we stayed in a beautiful national park just outside of Melbourne. Okay. Um, so I took a job basically as a personal trainer in a gym just outside of Melbourne, trained a few clients there. And, but yeah, I wasn't really happy because like, I was working for myself here, you know, and I had a full clientele. I was a coach here as well. Um, but then there I was working for somebody else, but I knew I had no choice somehow because no one knew me. Like if I started my own business, well, how can I get some clientele if no one knows me? Right. Um, so my game plan, what I did, I just trained super hard when I moved there and I try to get involved as much as I can in the running community. So I would go run with different groups, go train with different groups and do a lot of local race in there. And then people started to get to know me, basically. And my ex was pretty big in the running world there. So that helped me quite a bit. Um, so then I built basically after a year or so, not even six months, I built a reputation for myself and started a business. I opened my own studio there as a strength conditioning coach. Um, and yeah, in basically three to four months, I almost had a full schedule. So yeah, it was a big risk, but it worked. Yeah. yeah. And so it, your, your company was called The Garage, right? Yeah, that's it. And you built it like literally like right out of the garage in your yeah. house? Yeah, exactly it. Exactly. And at first I'm like, oh, that's a risk because I was 40 minute drive from the city, you know, like it's kind of like... You know, if if you're in Ottawa, it's kind of like the old the Wakefield, pretty much, you know, of Ottawa. So it's really outside. So I didn't know if I was going to get some clientele. But yeah, like it went super well, super well. So yeah, it was called The Garage. And then on top of that, one of my athletes was like, Matt, I heard like Nike are looking for a coach to run this eight week program. And I was like, huh. I'm like, okay, like, he's like, just send your resume and see what happens. I'm like, okay. So, and that's what I did. I send my resume was to, um, cause Nike Australia used to work with a event management company. And so I got basically I sent my resume and they hired me for that eight week program. And I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. I'm doing some work with Nike now. Like after a few interviews, I got the job. I'm like, whoa. So it was pretty unreal. And um, basically, I think it was like two to four weeks into my eight-week contract, uh, Nike Australia was like, Matt, like, are you interested to go do a photo shoot for Nike Global in the United States? I'm like, yeah. It's like, well, actually, like, you'll have to leave in like three to four days. I'm like, oh, my God. Okay. So I kind of made it work. So I was working for myself. You know, all my athletes were kind of under understandable. I'm like, yo, I got this gig with... You know, I'll probably be gone for two weeks. So, yeah, I went on a crazy trip. And, um, yeah, I went to Bonneville Salt Flats in Utah. I shoot there. We did kind of like a little commercial, whatever, for Nike. Then we did some shooting in Mexico City. Then I went to a coaching summit in New York City. I'm like, wow. And then that's kind of like how it started with Nike, basically. So, it was pretty sweet. Yeah. So... I had, that was actually perfect because that was the next point I was going to bring yes. up. It was called, it was called like Nike Run Club was the initial thing, yeah. right? So yeah. how did like that work? It was like, every, it started at 6.34. It was a, you guys just met and ran? Yeah. So yeah, it's, they had this thing because uh, Coach Bowerman was like very, very famous coach uh, for Nike. Oh, that was years and years ago. And he would always start his session at like 04 or 24 or because it, it just kind of stick 
you know, in your mind a little bit more. So we did the same thing with Nike Run Club. And that was a run club that was run like in the biggest city in the world, all around the world. Like basically when I went to New York City, we were 80 coaches from around the world, like Japan, China, um, France, uh, everywhere. And you can think about Brazil, like... They had a coach from everywhere. We were three from Australia that was sent there. Uh, two. Two from Australia, one from New Zealand. And uh, it was unbelievable because we got to connect with, like, different coaches from around the world for a whole week, you know. So I kind of had that contract. So after that eight week, they signed me for a year contract. And they signed me for another year. And then before I left, I was I was signed for my third year, basically. So it was it was an amazing experience, amazing experience to work for such such a cool company, uh, you know, probably one of the biggest in the running game. Um, so yeah, yeah, it was it was amazing. Yeah, and so I know I like kind of because I looked through your Instagram and some uh, saw some of the old Run Club stuff. Yep, there were some pretty like relatively like famous people, at least in Australia, that went to these, right? Because I think there was someone in one of the pictures that like. 200,000 or whatever followers on Instagram. Like, yeah, yeah. We always like, and that's the thing. Like, I remember we used to do those media piece with a lot of like celebrities. You know, they would come to the Nike Run Club or I would do a personal session with them and, uh, you know, on the track. But I didn't really know the celebrities in Australia because I was Canadian. So yeah. every time I'm like, I would tell my ex-girlfriend, I'm like, hey, I'm going to do like a running session with, you know, this guy. And she's like, what? <laughs> it's like, do you know who that person is? I'm like, no clue. It's like, yo, it's like most famous. I'm like, wow, really? So, yeah, I got the chance to work with some pretty cool people and some pretty big celebrities in Australia, which was, which was amazing. But to me, like, I would treat them like they loved it because I would go, like, on a running session with them and we were, like, buddies, you know, because... Yeah, it wasn't really Star Trek because I didn't really know who they were before I get the brief, you know, probably, you know, the day before the session. Yeah. Yeah. So was that, was that like through Nike you had those clients or is that just at, with the garage? That was true Nike. Nike, okay. Yeah, so that was true Nike. Uh, the garage I had like more kind of like I would say your weekend warriors and, um, you know, I've trained some some very elite athletes as well. Um, but yeah, all kind of like your celebrities, uh, were basically true Nike, I would say. Yeah. Do you have any, yeah. I think I saw some of our rugby players. Yeah. 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 I've trained a few rugby players as well, yeah. uh, which was fun, which was fun, which actually, yeah. Nick, Nick, the rugby player, he was my first, uh, athlete at the garage. Yeah. So he was my main, main, you know, first athlete and he basically trained with me until I left Australia. So it was pretty cool. Do you have any AFL players? No, no, I didn't have any no. AFL. Yeah, no, maybe if I would have been more in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it was mostly I had, yeah, a f couple rugby's and then mostly runners, you know, mountain bike, uh, triathletes. Uh, so it was more like I would specialize more in the endurance athlete in what I've done in Australia yeah. because of my title, because of what I've done as well as an athlete. So, yeah. Yeah. And speaking of you as an athlete, I think I saw somewhere you were like the seventh ranked Ultra marathoner in Australia at one point. Did yeah, it? so it's that race, well, the Costa Kazi race that I've done, I think to this day, or you know, I might be wrong, but I think I still have the seven best time of all time, and that's that's a pretty significant uh, race because first of all, you need to qualify for that race, so you need to do a few races to you know even just send your application, and then they got usually a panel of people that pick 50, 50 runners. Um, so yeah, that year I got in and, um, I came in third, but basically, you know, any other year beside a couple of years, I would have won it with the time I've done. So, and still to today, I think it's the seven to eight best time of all time, uh, on that course, uh, which is a 240 K race. Yeah. So yeah, that was, and then, yeah, I had a few good years in Australia. I was able to, you know, rack, racked a few wins and, and a few course record as well. Um, so it, yeah, it was fun. It was really, really fun, but I had the perfect training ground. Like I basically lived in the hills. Yeah. yeah so it was, it was unbelievable. 
And is there so is there like a world ranking or anything or like a world championship or like UTB or UTMB be like the, the Yeah, well it depends. Like the thing is because ultra running is getting more and more popular, there there is. Um so I would say like in Australia they have the Sky Running Championship. And Sky Running is a kind of like a world series, uh, but Sky Running is probably the most rugged alias technical races around the world and they have you know a few around the world and in australia it's called the buffalo stampede and i've done that one last year actually and it was the basically oceana uh championship so australia and new zealand um and i did the ultra there it was 75 kilometers and we climbed and descent about i think it was 4500 meters and uh, came third overall. So that was that was pretty big for me uh, because you get to really compete against the best, um, you know, because it's a it's kind of like the national championship, you know. So I was I was pretty pumped for that. Um, I I didn't really travel to Europe after your UTMB to to go race because that's basically where they have like the biggest ultra marathons and also the states have some big ones but it's it was very far from australia so i base i did more you know local races uh when i was there yeah yeah and then it was like september 2017 and that you moved back to canada right around yep. that time yep. i think yep that's that's it yeah that's it yeah and then so you said like your your Nike deal was kind of did it and then or did you still do work with them once you came back? Yeah, so because I was signed with Nike Australia, um, that was the tricky part. So I basically ended my contract with them when I knew I was coming back, um, which was too bad because we had a great great relationship, great relationship that you know lasted for three years. Um, so when I came back. Um, no, because, uh, you know, the work I was doing there is more, more groundwork, right? So, you know, I stayed in touch with, they put me in touch with Nike Canada. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, their Nike run club or, you know, their main hub, uh, for Nike running is Toronto, you know, and I knew I was going to base myself in Ottawa. So it just didn't kind of work out. Yeah. Yeah. So that was kind of like the end of, uh, my my nike gig you yeah. know yeah so that's fair but i'm sure you got like a bunch of like merch and gear and stuff through it oh and... it was unbelievable it was yeah for me it was so weird because i'm from a small town you know probably not even a thousand people you know farming town like 60 k's from ottawa and to be working for nike and you know traveling the world uh for such a big company it was like unreal you know and they would like i was not allowed to wear anything else or post anything else like it was in my contract but you know they would give me enough gear so i didn't have to wear anything else right so it was unbelievable unbelievable yeah um but you know that was cool but it was more the opportunity it gave me as a coach uh as an athlete as well and also to work within the australian running community it was so cool yeah so what what was that moment where you kind of stopped and you're like whoa like look where i am right now is that like the salt flats the photo shoot or oh yeah like that was unreal because that was basically like two to four weeks into my contract i just couldn't believe it i'm like oh my god you know like it was just being in the right place at the right time you know and you know i'm not the most educated or smartest coach in the world but i don't know i got the job i click with the right people and that's what i always say as a coach you know most of it you know it's not all about knowledge you know it's a lot has to do with personality and you know how you approach people and so yeah it all kind of it all worked out which was sweet yeah Yeah. and so then when you came back even though your contract kind of ended you were able to like kind of jumpstart your like coaching yeah gig like you had i think i saw somewhere like 10 or like 11 clients before you even yeah so when i when i knew i was coming back i kind of like just over the power of social media right so i all my social media i'm like hey i'm coming back i'm gonna be working at as this little studio my buddy owns um you know if you want to train with me those are my hours let me know you know so I, i say i'm taking 12 clients and yeah basically before i touched down in canada I pretty much fill up my spots, which was unreal. I'm like, oh my God, you know, I haven't been in Ottawa for four years. 
but power of social media. Like people I didn't even know they were still following my journey while I was in Australia, you know, but they were in Ottawa. Like when I came back, it's like, yo, you're coming back. I want to train with you. Yeah. So it was, it was so cool. Yeah. Um, but because I thought I was going back to Australia, I just did like kind of like a three months thing um because i thought i was gonna go back in january but my my visas didn't work out um so that's why basically i'm still here yeah um because before i came back i met you know another lovely girl um so that's why i'm like i'm gonna come back visit my family and then go back to australia but uh visa wise i wasn't able to i'm not able to go back this year yeah um so that's when i kind of like ramped up my business was this year in kind of like february when i knew i was not gonna go back to australia yeah yeah now it's just like that's your full time is just training and yep so now i basically train oh i do about 20 one-on-one session um with some athletes there i would say about 90 percent of them are runners you know trying to run their their fastest marathon or ultra marathon or you know a quicker half marathon or their first marathon um and then i got an online business as well um that i train about uh right now 10 15 athletes online so from all over the world i got some still from australia the united states um and then i try to do some work with the community so because for me nike didn't quite work um here in canada now i'm working closely with lululemon oh that's awesome because they're very involved in or they're trying to be more involved in running community in ottawa so i'm like amazing yeah. let's work together yeah. yeah so like what do you what do you do with lulu then so right now well i'm i'm not sure if i'm supposed to say that well, right you, now you don't but want to like, you don't no, have no, no, to. no but because they're gonna make me a run ambassador in ottawa first of august so okay. in a couple weeks so i can hold this and then once this <laughs> after august first i'll put it out <laughs> so um, i'm actually having like the final meeting on wednesday uh, in a couple days so basically it's just to try and ramp up and do cool stuff for the running community in ottawa so for example during the um you know ottawa race weekend here in ottawa we've done you know a shakeout run and then i just had to do like uh you know a little spill you know race visualization after the the 5k shakeout run and we also organized an, an event for uh running global day they're like matt uh so myself and the other um running ambassador kayla we were like okay like guys we got this amount of money like we want to do a cool shit event of running but not your regular like kind of like boring we want to do epic stuff i'm like okay so we we came came up with that idea um so we ran from beyond the pal so it's brewery like kind of like industrial area and it was teams of four it was kind of like a mile relay so we designed this loop it was like you had to go upstairs you know cross the road but there was no rules you know like if you want to burn the lights burn the lights whatever and you know everyone it was free to sign up we only accepted 100 runners we started at the brewery so it was a big relay um there was 20 teams 20 teams of five yeah that makes sense 20 teams of four 25 teams of four yeah and um yeah everyone in their their race pack they had two tickets for two pints one tickets for a shot so because you didn't know who was going to be on your team it was all random okay so it, that way you get to meet people yeah. right so you know you just had a number and it was cards so you had to find you had half an hour to go find and then once you find all your team you had to go at the bar and take a jameson or jagermeister shot yeah so you know it's just it was just kind of like different and yeah. get to meet different people from the running community in ottawa and then after that we just stayed at the brewery and drank some beers and ate some food and it was like amazing so yeah. kind of like stuff like that you know like just you know to bring the running community together yeah. basically so now yeah. that you're a run ambassador is your wardrobe going to kind of transition from nike to Lulu? yeah like, <laughs> that might happen <laughs> yeah that might happen probably not the running shoes yeah 
because uh, from my knowledge, I think Lululemon does start to do running shoes, but yeah, like running shoes are touchy. So yeah. I'm probably still going to run in Nikes, but yeah, it might turn into a little bit more Lululemon. That's yeah. for sure. Any pictures just above the ankle? You're, you're good, <laughs> yeah, right? like, exactly. <laughs> but it's, it's great clothes, you know, yeah. it's oh, a Canadian yeah. brand as well. So, and the people here in Ottawa, they're doing great stuff for the running community. So I'm, I'm pretty pumped. I'm really, really pumped to be working with them. How, how did they find you? Like, how did that connect with that through social media? That's a great question. So how did it happen? So, yeah, I guess social media did kind of had an impact on that. And it kind of happened that I trained, yeah, I trained Alex, which he was the husband of one of the Lululemon location. He was the her wife was the general manager okay. at one of the locations. Yeah. Yeah. And then they kind of put me in touch and then they looked me up, of course, on social media. Yeah. And they were like, hey, who's that guy? You know, yeah. <laughs> basically, where does he come from? Um, so, yeah, that's kind of like how it happens. Just again, being in the right place at the right time. And again, like, I think my social media had a great, you know, vibe to it and all yeah. that because without meeting me they just kind of like went to my social and then we went for meeting and then it's kind of like exploded from there yeah yeah so i think you're sitting at like what over thirteen thousand now on instagram yeah yeah, yeah. just over thirteen thousand right now yeah so it's yeah. awesome. so like how what did you do to grow it then like yeah so a few things like i last year i've put a little bit more focus on it i would say um so that was like i was always on it you know like putting a post basically a day um for me that's kind of like how it worked um but it seems it seems kind of like easy to put a post today but it's not like yeah. for oh, me no, it was strategic yeah. yeah like certainly when i started my business and all that like it was like okay hey, tuesday i'll do more of a coaching post and then the next day i'll do more of a running post and then the next day i'll do more of a you know life posts so it was very strategic the yeah. way i've done it um and then you kind of find out as you grow like what your fo followers are more attracted to yeah you know and for me like i think anytime i put a running post or a picture of me running that's where i'll have the most likes yeah you know but then you know if i put me coaching I won't have that much like. I'm like, huh, okay. Yeah. So it's kind of like you kind of learn as you go what kind of caps your audience more and more, yeah. right? So for me, yeah, it was consistency was one of the big thing. Uh, you know, I would spend basically an hour on it a day. Yeah. You know, just kind of like researching, you know, similar people and uh, doing a post, you know, which sometimes just to write a post would take me half an hour or so. Yeah. So, yeah, stuff like that. So consistency last year, that's where I gained most of my followers were was kind of like my, yeah, was kind of like my main thing. Yeah. Yeah. And when you're writing your, your caption stuff, do you use like hashtags at all or anything? Or? Yeah, ash absolutely. I did use hashtags. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Because yeah. yet, like, I don't consider myself a, a professional, you know, yeah. in terms of social media. But for me, it was just to keep things raw, you know. Yeah. And, you know, if it was a, already of a long post, you know, I wouldn't put like 10 hashtag at the bottom. I was just leave it yeah. you know uh but if it was a short post like hey running in the mountains yeah you know then i would put a few hashtags so it would all depends yeah. i guess um so and yeah like one thing i've done i've organized a few photo shoots as well yeah um so i would or i had one of my good buddy lyndon marceau he's a phenomenal photographer and I would organize like a photo shoot in my gym or a photo shoot me running and, you know, in the outdoors and just trying to get as many pictures as I can and use those, you know, through a space of three months. Yeah. You know, so and that was extremely useful. And that's oh, something yeah. I haven't done, you know, since I've been back to Canada. But I want to do because I know it's so much easier because then you can plan ahead. Mm -hmm. You know, you can say, OK, like now I got a picture of strength training, running, coaching, and then you can kind of like plan your week for yeah. your social media yeah. right because for me it's my biggest marketing tool like mm -hmm. i don't have a website 
Um, I don't have signs. Like I, I barely have like business card, you know, like yeah. if people wants to get in touch with me, I'm like, well, just go on my Instagram, yeah. you know, write me on my Instagram and you know, we'll go from there. Yeah. And usually we'll get through emails and then, yeah. So that's my main marketing tool basically. Yeah. So yeah. with like those photo shoots, like that's super interesting because my last, the last podcast guys I had yep. did the exact same thing. Okay. He said he'd go out, he'd, he'd get someone to do a photo shoot and they'd take like a bunch of pictures and then he's got content for a yep. while. Yep. Um, one point he brought up was he would change his outfit. Like he would bring like a yes. tub of clothes. Is it, did you do the Absolutely. same thing? Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. It's like, yeah, you bring, yeah, five, six different outfit and, you know, usually a good photographer will get like different different scenery and yeah. yeah absolutely and that's that's massive yeah massive so yeah that's that's definitely a must because for me like when i train like i consider myself a serious athlete so i don't want to stop middle of my run taking a picture yeah you know because like i'm training like i'm, I'm focusing on my training like last thing on my mind is to take a good picture mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Or like when I'm coaching or, you know, it's so it's difficult. It's yeah. very difficult. So it's doable and I do it once in a while, but so much easier if you kind of like sacrifice, you know, a day or two just to get those pictures, you know, yeah. like, you know, you don't have to be putting like, you know, makeup and this and that. It yeah. just has to stay raw you know it's me going out for a run but i have this photographer like following me you know or it's me in the gym working out you know i work out like i usually do and it's up to you to get the good angles and all that kind of stuff so i want to keep it raw yeah so yeah that's 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 definitely a must yeah for sure so when you were like planning it did you have did you like sit down like plan your week for what photos you're gonna post or did you kind of just kind of like Look, kid, did this yesterday. Like, I did a workout pick yesterday, so I should probably do a run pick today. Or was like planned like a week in yeah, advance. Yeah, so I would briefly plan it, mm-hmm. um, and then you just get it inspired by different things as you know your day or your week goes on. Yeah. So that's kind of like how I would see it. Yeah. Like I had an idea which picture I wanted to put, but then you know something would pop in. And you get inspired by something or someone. It's like, oh, I want to talk about this. Yeah. You know, so I kind of like had K. Yeah. Tuesday, I'm going to do coaching. Then yeah. Wednesday, I'm going to do strength training. Then Thursday, I'm going to do running. And then, you know, Friday, it's going to be just a, a light running shot. Just keep it short, you know. So I had an idea. But then the morning I would sit down, so it would be okay. Like, what am I writing about today? Yeah. You know? So, yeah, I yeah. would take some time. Because for me, it was like I'm self-employed. So it was part of my working hours. It's take an hour, you know, trying to come up with a good post. And, you know, yeah. Yeah. So, so when you, you said you said, so though you it was like last year you started doing the post a week then? Yeah. Or was it in Australia still when you were doing that? Or was it kind of when you came back? So I would say beginning of last year. Yeah. I was more into it. Okay. Yeah. And then, to be honest, since I've came back to Canada, I haven't been that consistent. Yeah. And I could see it. Like, in my followers, it's not going up, as, you know, as quick. Yeah. Right? But I, I know, you know, if it's something I go back to, I can kind of, like, regrow it. And for sure, like, my different opportunities, like, working with such a big brand with Nike. Yeah. That kind of probably had a good impact you know, because sometime at our run clubs, we had like at the beginning, we had up to 200 people. Yeah. You know, like at each session. So it was ridiculous. So yeah. you get a lot more exposure that way as well. That's true. Yeah. So when did you really see like how long were you posting once a day before you really started to see that and you kind of that trend upwards? Um. So for me, it kind of took, I would say, three to four months. Okay. Yeah. Three to four months. Um. And then I kind of like saw it was coming up pretty yeah more quick more consistently yeah 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 but you you also had like your niche to find like you knew what you were posting basically yes. that probably helped a lot too absolutely like you gotta and that's what i always say like for for instagram or marketing or even as a coach or a personal trainer like you need a niche yeah like you definitely need a niche like people follow me because i'm i'm the the running coach yeah. or you know the ultra marathon guy you know, like that's, that's what they follow me 
for like and as a tra- as a trainer as a coach you know i specialize in training endurance athletes you yeah. know then that's what i always say in people that you know are starting in coaching or starting in personal training it's you know you got to find your niche you got to you know okay you're the specialist in this you yeah. know or, or in that then your social media has to kind of like mirror that yeah you know in some perspective yeah. So and yeah, for me it helps because I I basically I practice what I preach. Mm-hmm. So you know yeah I'm the running coach but I run a shitload as well. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> you know and people see that through my social media. So they they kind of like for me I want to show that to them because like sometimes I get a lot like oh man like this guy runs a lot like and I want to do my first fifty k well you know. He obviously coach and he's yeah. coached a lot of ultra runners, but he's been there, done that himself. So, and yeah. for me, that's that speaks a lot. Even if I hire myself a coach, you know, I want to know like he's been there, he's done that, he's hurt, you know, he's been through the process, you know, like that's that's really important to me, you know, like it's not all about knowledge, it's experience, you know, he, he lived it, right? Yeah. So that's that's yeah that's very important for sure. Yeah, and that because that also just like reflects on like when you talk about with the pictures you're making like raw and real like yep. you're practicing what you're preaching but you're also like showing you're not hiding anything with it like it's just yep you're you, what you see is what you get basically exactly and that's like probably you saw it on my Instagram like sometime I'll post like a picture of of a beer or you yeah. know like because I, yeah that's that's who I am like yeah. yeah I train hard but I like to have a couple beers here and there and people relate to that yeah like if you always post you know about something perfect all the time like people are gonna say yeah you know like this guy is too perfect like it's it's not real you yeah. know then when they really get to know you through that social media like that's that's how can people relate to you even more mm-hmm. like in my perspective that's what I think yeah, yeah. And you were talking about, like, you're not growing as much now because you're not posting, like, every day like you yeah. used to. But, I mean, you're still growing because when I, I took my notes probably about a month and a half ago, and yep. you're, like, 12 and a half. Okay. So, you're up, like, 500 and just over a month. So yeah, so still, that's still pretty you're good. You're still growing. Yeah. And yeah. so, like, I always wonder with people with, like, a sizable following, mm-hmm. what does your, like, DMs look like? Do you get a lot of people like me just hopping in your DMs, like, buying your message, asking for different things? Or? Um, yeah, like, that's what I always say, like... You know, if people contact me through Instagram, I'll always, you know, I'll try to get back to them, but yeah. then get back to them. Certainly for a business perspective, I'll give them my email and I'll say, get in touch with me on my work email. Because, yeah, you kind of like get lost. You know, it's it's so difficult. And that kind of like fits in in like my hour a day of yeah. social media. Like it's to get back to everyone because... You know, it's it's important, you know, so I try my best to get back to everyone. But then, you know, if I know it's going to be, you know, an ongoing conversation or yeah. a business conversation, then I'll, I'll basically send my email you know, or my phone number. So that way we can get in touch that way, because that's something I'll, you know, never get lost in. Because, yeah, you you can get lost, you know, in in all those messages for oh, sure yeah absolutely yeah so, and did you just say you only go on social media like one hour a day then like oh uh, no like i'll I'm, I'm victim of it i'll go more yeah but you know i'll go more just to see what's going on uh but for you know post wise or research things um but not for the fun of it um you know i try to do at least an hour oh, it's like an hour of like business social yeah media business stuff. so either built the story you know yeah. or built the post or you know research you know like you know people that kind of like do what i do you know and you know see what kind of followers do they have and all that kind of stuff so yeah that's pretty yeah. important as well i like that you called it building a post because it's not just like you throw like it, it yeah. takes time like it's not just something like a lot of people think of social media they think it's just like two seconds and it's done yeah like when you have that many followers like building it you actually have to like build the yep. actual post I yep. like that definitely definitely and like my first language is French and I do all my social media in English and mm-hmm. for me writing it's not that easy yeah. so you know to write like you know a, a solid post like it takes me a while yeah. right like it's, it doesn't come easy to me um, so yeah it is time consuming yeah. it is time consuming but for me it's important absolutely because yeah. again that's my that's my main 
source of marketing uh, for my business and me as an athlete. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so in that build, like, do you edit your pictures a certain way every time or do you just kind of like play with the sliders, see what looks good and go with it? Yeah. Or? So I'll, I'll edit it. Yeah. yeah. I'm pretty picky with that kind of stuff. I'm somehow of a perfectionist, you know, in many aspects of my life. So yeah, I'm pretty picky with that. Did you find like a certain time of day work? I'm always interested as like. Oh uh, yeah. Well at first, yes. But now it's tricky because I got a lot of followers from Australia True. and then the United States and Canada. Yeah. And then I got a few from Europe. So it's kind of like for me, because I live in Australia and I built, you know, a lot of my followers while I was there. And now I know I got a lot of United States and Canada followers as well. So which is like completely different time mm -hmm. zone. So I don't pay as much attention anymore, to yeah. be honest. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, because like with my personal social media, I've like because I lived in Manitoba. Yep. So it, it's like one hour, and I'm trying to like is seven thirty good here, but then six thirty there people are eating. Yeah. I can't even imagine doing it like other side of the world, like completely <laughs> different times. Like, but the year I was consistent. Yeah, yeah, I was very. I was timing was was yeah. everything definitely. You know, in the morning when you know people are checking their yeah. social media, definitely that would I would pay attention a lot to that. Yeah, yeah but not anymore because I just don't know yeah. because like to figure out Australia and then Canada is like ah, you yeah. know what? Yeah, in the morning, eh? Like posting yeah, in the morning. Yeah, well, because a lot of people like yeah. first thing they do in the morning. No, it, for sure. They check their social media. Yeah. You know, like five, ten minutes before getting out of bed. Yeah. And I found like that was one that worked quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's awesome. And yeah, I know for myself, absolutely. Like, you know, now because my girlfriend lives in Australia, you know, I wake up by myself and I was like, oh, let's check what's going on in the world. Like, I don't have TV or whatever. So yeah. like for me, like social media, it's cool because I like it because... I follow people like I'm interested in, yeah. you know, interested in what they do and all that. So, you know, it's good news, mm -hmm. you know, most of the time. So I rather check what's going on in their world and all that than, you know, what happened in freaking, I don't know, somewhere I don't even know, you know, and yeah. there's war and all that. Cause I'm, I'm all about, you know, keeping things as positive as I can. Yeah, so I know, for sure. the people I follow, it's, they kind of like, you know, they, I can feed off them basically. Yeah. 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 So, That's awesome. yeah. So is there any like helpful like apps or like websites you use when you're like either managing or like building your posts and stuff? Like I know one I use is like UNUM and you can like see when you have a new picture, you can see what it looks like in your feed before you post it kind oh, of thing. Oh man. No. Yeah. I never. Nothing just all in Instagram. Uh, I'm trying to remember from the past. I've used anything yeah not really I'm not like I said I'm not very tech yeah savvy so yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's cool though like, um yeah I've never really like all I use you know in terms of pictures and all that is all Instagram the filters and everything yeah yeah that's awesome though like, but yeah I'm sure there's there's many greater ways out there oh, yeah. and i'm always willing to learn for sure but, i mean what works for you works for you yeah right? definitely so, definitely yeah absolutely so yeah yeah and outside of like so nike and lululemon is there any other brands you've worked with that have like seen your social media and like hey like maybe sponsored post or anything like that um so there's always like yeah like right now i'm working uh with cielly so that uh hat company i was gonna ask about the hat i've never seen a hat like that before. yeah so that's uh some some guys in montreal they started those running hats and yeah. the, all they specialize is running hats okay and man they they're big now like yeah. they're they you know they're in australia japan like you name it and yeah. uh yeah for example we got kind of like a partnership yeah so i just you know they send me a few hats here and there and i get to wear their sweet hats yeah and um i just post you know a few posts on social media here and there and then same thing um i was doing an adventure race i did a 24-hour adventure race so that's yeah. basically mountain bike trail running trekking and paddling yeah and but i didn't have a mountain bike i'm like oh my god i'm racing in four weeks i need to get a mountain bike so i just on my instagram story i'm like looking for a mountain bike uh anyone can help and then i tag all the bike shops yeah in ottawa and then eurosports 
uh, this sweet little bike shop just off Parkdale got in touch with me. He's like, hey, Matt, maybe we can work some some kind of a partnership together. Yeah. I'm like, let's talk. I'm like, cool, yeah. for sure. So we kind of like worked out a partnership together and he you know i got a sweet bike out of them you know not for free but yeah you know discounted and you know i had to do a so uh give them a little bit of social media exposure and all that and you know it's the best of both world basically yeah. so yeah little gigs like that which has been pretty sweet yeah for sure uh in my line of work um so yeah and like recently that's since i've been back to canada that's kind of like the gigs I've had, yeah. yeah. So I, th I think you you touched on earlier that Instagram's like your only platform, really. Yeah. Well, I do have Facebook. Yeah. Um, but I think Facebook, I got twenty five hundred friends. Okay. Which is all right. Yeah. Um, but I I kind of find Facebook it's more uh, people that knows me really really well. Yeah. You know, or we had like we had a, a connection yeah. before. You know, it's um. Yeah, so I do use Facebook, uh, but not as much as Instagram, I would say. Yeah. So, yeah, I would say Instagram is kind of like the one I'm trying to be more and more consistent. But I used to use Facebook because I got a lot of buddies, you know, in in a, in Canada yeah. that don't have Instagram, yeah. believe it or not, you okay. know, and my family as well. They don't really yeah. have Instagram. So it was a way for them to stay in touch of what I was doing, you know, yeah. through Facebook. So everything I would post on Instagram, I would just kind of like share it on my Facebook. Okay. Yeah. And like Twitter, not at all. Eh? Twitter, not at all, to no. be honest. I do have a Twitter account, but I don't use it. Yeah. And yeah, I haven't been on. I just, for me, it was like I said, like I'm someone that needs to focus on one thing and do it well. So that's why when I told myself, okay, Histogram, it's kind of like what's going, like what's big in yeah. my perspective, what's what's popular right now. So I'm just going to focus on that. Um, and then I used to, yeah, just share whatever I share on my Instagram on Twitter and Facebook. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. But Instagram was kind of like the main one. Yeah. And then you don't really do much YouTube either, eh? No, no, no. Um, and I, you know what? Like, I've got approach, and I've I've tried, yeah. um, but again, it's just another thing. And and as I'm not, it comes to a point for me, like business wise, I'm busy enough, right? Yeah. Uh, just doing what I do on Instagram. Like right now, you know, I'm basically basically full. You know, I yeah. got a full full roster in terms of athletes yeah. you know I'm, I'm living a pretty good life so it's always to a point like how big you want to get yeah. right so for sure i could do youtube and all that but my head is like well why would i want to build the bigger audience if i'm already busy enough right That's so true. it's kind of like for me it, it was it kind of came to that point yeah. right so i don't mind still building my instagram because i want to keep that fresh and i know like i got a good attraction to that but why start you know, other platform when that one is working so well now. Yeah. But I wouldn't say never, never. Yeah. Because uh, I think it's it, they're all great tools. Yeah. Um, but it's just right now, yeah, it's not in my focus. So I have one other thing about YouTube. Yep. So I found, I actually found your YouTube. Yes. And there's actually like an epic video on there that you made probably yes. like six years ago. Yeah, What's six, seven story? years ago. It's like you're kind of just like going through your day basically as a, yeah. as a long distance runner. So yeah, at first I've used YouTube in the past. That yeah. Yep. So when I first started my business, uh, I was 25 years old. So my cousin was like... You know, he was pretty good, you know, tech-wise and all that. Now he's, like, working in Vancouver somewhere. Like, that's what he does for a living. Yeah. You know, but he was kind of practicing on me. And he, we made a video of my first 100 miles. If you check on YouTube and you type my name, you'll probably found it. And then we did kind of, like, a promotion a video of, like, who it was. Yeah. Basically, I think it was, like, a three- or four-minute video and um that was kind of like my promotional video back then and yeah i think it worked quite well which you know i i wouldn't mind uh doing more of that yeah um but I, for here when i came back i knew instagram i had a lot of followers so my cousin came in january or february and we did some shooting in the gym and we did some short little 30 60 second promotional video for my business here 
because uh, when I started my bit, ramp up my business here in February, I'm like, man, I need some advertising stuff and all that. So we did those and that worked quite well. So I just kind of like posted on Instagram my stories and then poof, yeah. it kind of like blew up. And then, yeah, I was I was busy again. Yeah. But yeah, YouTube, yeah, I, I've used it in the past okay. and it worked quite well. Do you yeah. think it kind of like move maybe not youtube like instagram tv like is that something you're looking at at all or oh perhaps yeah perhaps like i really enjoy it yeah i really enjoy it but like i said i'm not i'm not very technical that's that's my only downfall so but you know when i learn something i want to learn it well so you know it might be something that i'll get in the future for sure yeah that's awesome so then i just wanted to move kind of away from social media now yep. back to coaching. So kind of like your coaching style. Cause you kind of say like, um, you're not like strict, strict, strict. You'll have like a beer like yep. on the weekend or whatever. It's so like, how would you kind of describe your coaching style then? Yeah. So for me, it's all about balance, right? So, and that's what I say to all my athletes and that's what I try to preach as well. So coaching style is I try to adjust, yeah. you know, like, cause most people I coach, they're not professionals. So, you know, they got, they got a life outside of training you know they got work they got a family they got stuff going on so for me i don't have a a particular style i try to adjust to every athlete's because every athlete's needs to be responded differently yeah so i always say to to be able to adjust to your athlete is very very important as a coach um so for example, like I'll, I'll give them, you know, the perfect workout. So what I usually do, it's basically, okay, like tell me exactly what you do in a typical week, yeah. you know, what you've been doing. And then I'll try to monitor their, their training around that, mm-hmm. right? And then I'll say, okay, in the perfect world, if you're able to do all of this, that's frigging phenomenal, yeah. right? But in my head i won't say them right off the bat you know i'll say if they're able to do 80 percent of that that's pretty sweet she's probably gonna or he's gonna probably attain their goals right so that's kind of like how i am and i always say like be good like trying to smash you know 80 percent of the time be good eat good you know and then 20 percent enjoy yourself you know like still go out with your your boys have a few beers chicken wings or your girlfriends you know have a wine or you know that's that's cool because that's if that's what you like doing keep doing that right um but i'll be honest with them i'm like okay if you want to lose 10 pounds or run a little bit quicker we'll need to do this this and that we need to do a few sacrifices but you're not gonna have to cut everything off right so i'm trying to be understandable right so yeah to be adaptive adaptable understandable i think it's very very important as a coach and that's what i try to do with most of my athletes yeah yeah so for that 80 percent, what's like nutrition and stuff look like for that yeah like depends on who you are yeah. i always say and it depends on what you like um you know i got some athletes there you know in the high fat you know high protein low carbs kind of diet you know um, I'm a carb burning machine. I freaking love carbs. Like, so I'll never do a high fat, high protein because I, I freaking love carbs. I yeah. love bread. And man, like, I exercise, you know, 10, 15 hours a week. So, you know, I can eat as many carbs as I want. I won't gain weight. Yeah. You know, so if I want to eat a bagel with cream cheese in the morning, I'll do it. You yeah. know, <laughs> so, yeah. um, so, but it's to be like, for, for me, what I say is like, be good. Whatever works for you, be good 80% of the time. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, eat your vegetable, eat your fruits, you know, eat a good amount of protein, good fats, like be healthy 80% of the time. Yeah. And then 20% of the time, man, like treat yourself, you know, have that pepperoni and cheese pizza, you know, have that Coca-Cola that you love so much that you probably drank every day but now you're drinking it once once a week yeah. you know what i mean so that's the 20 you yeah. know it's to kind of like it's a reward like you've trained hard all week well yeah have your freaking medium pizza and your two liters of coke you know like i don't care you've yeah. worked hard all day uh, all week and you've trained hard so who cares celebrate yeah, yeah. that's awesome so that's kind of like the 80 20 that i always try to preach and i always try to you know tell my athletes because most of the time people will try that 100 percent approach unless you're a pro athlete you'll do it for a few weeks and then you'll 
freaking crash yeah at some unless you're like part of that you know very minimal percentage that they can be bang 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 for the rest of their life but yeah. that's very very rare yeah. yeah so for me the 80 20 percent rule is very important so for like goal setting and like reaching your goals is that 80 20 one of your biggest things or do you have other like tactics you use because like i figured that's easier to attain something when you're like you don't have to be perfect when you're getting there yeah but yeah so that's in terms of goal setting that's yeah that's one of the big thing i kind of say to all my athletes right off the bat yeah um and then it's to be consistent consistent and patient you know because a lot of people want some results now Mm -hmm. but depending on your goal i'll be i'll always be honest with them you know um consistency i think is key like you can't train freaking hard for a week and then take two weeks off and then expect to run a marathon in 10 weeks you know like you just gotta chip at it day after day you know day after day and so consistency and patient is always the two biggest things i preach and try to teach to all my athletes so if you're able to be consistent in your own personal way with your training and have a little bit of patient you'll most of the time you'll be successful like it's it's not rocket science like training like if you're moving you know five six times a week you know for for half an hour to an hour you'll get in better shape you know it's whatever you're doing if you're moving 30 to 60 minutes five to six times a week you'll get in better shape you know so but that's consistency right so that's for me it's that's the number one thing yeah Yeah. and one other thing i've seen you post different places is we're all born runners yeah it's like what does that mean yeah so for me like basically if if you got a body you can run yeah like because you know, there's, I believe that the human body was designed to run the wo- the way, like, way, way, way back in the days. Like, we basically had to outrun our food. Um, but it's just our lifestyle now that kind of, like, screws up. Yeah. Um, so, if someone, if if you never really ran before and you're like, Matt, I want to run a marathon. Can, yeah. Do you think I can do it? I'm like, for sure you can do it. Yeah. Mm, absolutely you know but we got to check you know what you've done in the past and then what's your weaknesses and because like maybe you've been sitting at a desk for the last 15 years you know yeah. so you got freaking tight hip flexors your glutes are not activating so i think yeah the body is perfectly designed to run it's just a matter of you know getting it there again yeah. right cuz when everyone when they were well not everyone but most people when they were born yeah they were running all the time when they were kids right yeah but it's just a matter of lifestyle that kind of screws up basically so that's why anyone that approached me is like matt i want to run a half marathon yeah you can do it i want to run 100k you know yeah you can do it sometime like if they say i want to run 100k i've never ran but can i do it in 10 weeks i'm like oh well <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i'm like it might be possible but yeah i don't recommend it you yeah. know so I'll, yeah. I'll i always have to be honest in that perspective but i'll never be the one saying no you can't do it because yeah i truly believe anyone can run yeah. it and so kind of on that to that effect your dad because you talked about earlier he beat cancer yep and then he ran the boston marathon after right yeah 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 so my dad basically he got into running again like he was really good shape and then he had three boys yeah. that was you know highly active and into everything so you know i've put on i think it was like 20 to 30 pounds so but when we all left when he was 52 his dad died when he was 52 from an heart attack so he was like oh man like i gotta put my you know my life together and and get healthy again so he basically started to train with me where i used to work and then put him like a little running program and he could barely run 15 minutes and then three months later he ran his first marathon at 55 years old and he ran a sub four sub four marathon awesome which he was 55 so it's pretty good time for his first marathon so we did it together the ottawa marathon and then basically the year after that we did the 5k at the ottawa race weekend so exactly a year and he could barely run 5k and i'm like dad man like there's something wrong like you were running a marathon quicker than your 5k like you gotta 
you know, go see the doctors and figure out what's going on. And then, yeah, he pushed and pushed. And basically, two to three months later, he was diagnosed with blood cancer. Pretty Like, no, it's all good. Like, it was pretty severe. But running saved him, basically, because he was so in tune with his body. Instead of being like your typical... 50 year old man saying i'm getting old you know i'm getting fatigued like my dad was like no like this is not normal right because i was running a marathon last year and now i can barely run 5k they they found his cancer just in time uh, so it was treatable yeah so he went like s- about six months of you know treatment chemotherapy and all that kind of stuff and then it was kind of like he was on the comeback so yeah. Trained him for another three three years, I would say. Yeah. And uh, he ran the Ottawa Marathon again. So that was his second marathon. And it's like, for him, it was just a way to prove, like, even if I had cancer, like a pretty severe blood cancer, like, I'm going to prove to myself I'm even stronger. And yeah, he ran a personal best. So he's beat his previous time before cancer. And he was a bit older as well. Um, so for him, that was remarkable. So he, he ran his Boston qualifier on his second uh, ever marathon, and that was his comeback marathon as well. So he did Boston this year. Good for him. That's awesome. Yeah. So pretty, pretty cool story. And like, he's an inspiration for me because it just goes to show, like, even if you go to rock bottom, you know, you're able to come back even stronger. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of like my dad and little story, which is pretty sweet. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. So there's one, before we get into like some like wrap up rapid fire questions, one yep. other thing I wanted to ask you about. Mm-hmm. You had a pretty sweet mustache going for a little while. Yeah. What, yep. What was the story behind that? Well, I don't know. Like, when did it start? So with the Nike thing, we were just a few guys that had a mustache. And it just became a thing, you know. And, you know, I had this mustache. I basically almost had a mullet, you know. So it was just kind of like a style. And then we did, like, a big charity event for Movember. Yeah. Because uh, a good buddy of mine in Australia, he works for Movember. Um, so that kind of, like, probably had an impact as well. So yeah. we were just a few boys uh, on the Nike crew that was like supporting the mustache, yeah. which was pretty sweet. And I really enjoyed my mustache. Uh, it's just now my girlfriend at the moment hates it. Yeah. But I'm like, <laughs> I met her with the biggest mo and like basically a mullet. So I'm like, hey, yeah. you basically fell in love <laughs> when I had a mo. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I'm like, let me bring it back. So it's coming back in September. Oh, awesome. Yeah, so I'm, I'm definitely going to bring it back from November and all that. It was hard. It was hard to cut it. Yeah, yeah. No, I can so imagine. It was, a, it was a lot of work, and I really, yeah, I really enjoyed it. All right, so we're kind of just like getting like some like rapid-fire questions, yep. kind of. So like, don't have to dive. If you want to dive deep, you totally can. Cool. You don't have to. But the so first one is like your favorite app. Uh, quickly like that. If you, you can go longer if you want to. Like, I would say, oh, I can't remember the specific name. I know, where you take a look. I'll just uh, take a look. Because, again, I don't have a TV. Mm-hmm. So, for me to just kind of catch up what's going on in the sport world. Yeah. Uh, the score. Oh, yeah. The score. Yeah. Uh, that Like, I just think it's a good overall sport app. Yeah. You know, I so I can check, oh, did the Blue Jay win or did the Red Blacks win or, you know, so it's, yeah, yeah. the score. That's awesome. Um, okay, next one is like, I guess probably not uh, the best question because you don't have a TV, but is there anything you're binging? Like, do you watch Netflix? Oh, I, yeah, so I have a laptop, so I do watch Netflix. Um, I change from series to series, yeah. So right now, what have I been uh, watching? It was, um, oh man, terrible with titles, but it was, uh, it's a one-word title. But it's kind of like a guy that um, he takes those pills and he can use like basically Limitless. all his brains. yes. Yeah, unbelievable. So yeah. I just finished the series this weekend. Yeah, yeah. So that was uh, that's what I've been watching. Yeah. You recommend it though? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's it's pretty cool. Like it makes you realize, like you know, like we we don't use our full potential all the time. So yeah, I thought it was pretty good. Pretty good. Funny at the time, and it's kind of like a crime scene. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I like it. Because this next one take, needs a little bit of like explanation. So the question is, what are you obsessed with? But it's not like on like a high level. Like yeah, uh, like I'm obsessed with ultra marathons. But it could be something like 
I'm obsessed with this one pair of socks I have. They're just so comfy. Like something off the wall random that you're yep. like obsessed with. Ah. Uh, so for me, like, I'm not a big material kind of guy. Yeah. Um, but like I do have a lot of sport apparel, like, mm-hmm. you know, and that's really important to me. But I would say what I'm obsessed with are probably my newest yeah, road shoes. Yeah. Um yeah, it's the Nike um it's one of the new nike shoes uh they're very comfortable yeah. and like i only use them to race basically the nike flies nike flies so that's like something like they're always in the same spot in my room you know mm-hmm. i only wear them for races so yeah. that's yeah that's kind of like somewhat my babies yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. any like hidden gems or like must eat spots in ottawa Oh, like, I haven't been out that much since I've been in Ottawa. Like, I always go to my buddy Luke. He owns a sport bar. Uh, that's a guy that came to Chamonix with me and, like, yeah. the cancer survivor as well. So, um, he's uh, he owns the St. Louis, Louis Bar and Grill on Elgin. Okay. So, yeah, I'm always there on the patio. Certainly summertime. It's great because they got this big patio, tiki bar, like good vibes. And then even wintertime, like it's nice and cozy to watch like Ottawa Senators game or the NFL there. It's yeah. pretty sweet. So yeah. that's kind of like always my go-to, basically yeah. the St. Louis Bar and Grill on Elgin Street. Nice. Yeah. Um, quick, just advice for someone that wants to get into running. Yeah, I would just start easy. Yeah. You know, start easy and be patient. That's that's always the biggest thing, you know, like and give yourself some time. Yeah. So again, consistency and patience, like we we start uh, like I mentioned earlier on, that's that's your two biggest weapon. You know, like if you start running, if you just start, you know, with it could be a five to ten minute jog, super easy jog that you do three times a week for the next three weeks. Yeah. That's awesome. And then just add on to that so if you're consistent and patient you'll be successful awesome all right last one yep before like wrap up what's one thing you want people to know about you it could be anything well uh, yeah again well, one one special thing eh? yeah, it was kind of a tough one yeah <laughs> <laughs> no i like it i like it um i'm a twin Oh, cool. So you can't really see that on my social media. Yeah. Because he's not on social media. Okay. Which is like crazy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I got, we're not identical, but like if you would see him on the street tomorrow, you would probably think it's me. Okay. We're very, very alike. Yeah. So yeah, it's kind of crazy, but he's not on Facebook or Instagram and all that. So that's why. I basically have no picture of him yeah. on my social media. But yeah, I'm a twin and we're we're basically best buddies. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, man, I want to give you the floor. Anything you want? Like where can people find you? Any like Yeah, so basically like I said, Instagram, uh, that's the best way to find me at my full name, Mathieu Doré Run. Um, and then yeah, right now I'm in Ottawa. Um, I've been, I was in Australia and Melbourne for about four years, but I've been in Ottawa for the last few months and I'm here for a little while. Um, so I worked at, of, uh, LBR training. That's the little studio I worked at. It's just yeah. on main street. Uh, but yeah, the best way is, yeah. If you, if you connect with me on Instagram, usually I'm pretty good at getting back to you in two to three days. Um, and then, yeah, we connect via email and. Yeah, we rock rock and roll from there. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you for being on the show. No, thank you, man. That was great. That yeah. was great. And uh, I feel honored to be uh, one of your first guests. So. Yeah, man, you're, you're the first guest that I didn't know before the show. Yes. So, like, my first, the first episode was with my buddy. Yep. So, you're the first guy I didn't know prior to the show. Cool, man. Yeah, well, man. no, this is sweet. This is sweet. Well, you know a lot more about me now. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, I did a lot of creeping <laughs> yeah, before no, this. I love it. But, I love yeah. it. No, that's awesome, man. And uh, all the best as well. And Thank you. Um, no, it's pretty cool it was it was it's always great just to have a chit chat with someone and that was that was that was awesome i really enjoyed it cool Cool. awesome thank you and i just want to thank everyone for listening to this episode make sure you subscribe and check out matt's here on instagram again it's matia.a run and you can find me at at the jacob kelly on instagram and twitter thank you once again we'll talk soon awesome (laughs) 
Thank you once again for listening to my social life, especially if you've listened to the entire way through. I really, really appreciate it. That means a lot to me. Make sure you go and follow Mathieu on Instagram at at Mathieu Doré Run. He's a great guy and he posts some awesome content, especially if you're into health, wellness, fitness, running. Like He's got some really good stuff on there. And even if you're not into those things, I still recommend you check him out. He's a good follow. I will make sure I link to his handle in the show notes down below. And if you wish to follow me, you totally can. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at, at the Jacob Kelly. And if there's anyone you want me to have on the show, make sure you let me know. You can tweet it at me, DM me. And even if you're watching on YouTube, let me know in the comment section down below. I will do my best to respond to everyone. Thank you once again for listening to my social life with Jacob Kelly. We'll talk soon.